Good morning. Uh, today, Pastor Peter Chen will share the message from Matthew 16, 13 through 19. I'll read in English in the First Nations Version. Hear the word of the Lord. They journeyed on and came into the territory of the ruler of the horsemen. Uh, I, I, I always mess up this name. Uh, Caesarea Philippi. This territory was ruled by Chief Looks Brave, Herod, under the authority of the ruler of the people of iron, Caesar. There was a cave and a deep bottomless pit there that was called by the local people, the gate of the dark underworld of death, Hades. This was a place of bad medicine and lying spirits. When they came into this place, Creator sets free, Jesus, asked the ones who walked, uh, asked the ones who were walking the road with him, who do the people think the true human being is? What are they saying? His followers looked around at each other and then back to Creator sets free, Jesus. Some say gift of goodwill, John, who performed the purification ceremony, they answered. Others say great spirit is Creator, Elijah, or even lifted by Creator, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He then lowered his voice and spoke in a more serious tone. So tell me, he asked them, how do you see me? Who do you say that I am? Silent faces stared back at him. They began to look at each other and some looked down at the ground. The moment of truth had, had come, but no one dared to speak. Then suddenly a voice pierced through the silence. You are the chosen one. One who hears, also called stands on the rock, Simon Peter answered, the son of the living creator. Creator sets free, Jesus smiled at him and said, one who hears, Simon, son of the wings of dove, bar Jonah, create, creator's blessing rest on you, for flesh and blood did not help you see, but father from above opened your eyes. For this reason, I give you the name stands on the rocks, Peter, and upon this great rock I will make my sacred family stand strong, and the powers of the dark underworld of death, Hades, will not stand against them. I give you the authority of God's uh, creator's good road from above. The things you do not permit on earth will be what creator has not permitted in the spirit world above. The things that you permit on earth will be what creator has permitted in the spirit world above. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, I did want to give a shout out to Christopher and Eunice for uh, their recent wedding. So glad that you guys are here with us today. We can celebrate that. Um, with that, we are going to get into the message for this morning. Um, we're in the sermon series where we're looking at names. We've been looking at the names of God, the names of, of people in the Bible. And today we're going to talk about a very famous name passage, which is this passage talking about, about Peter and where he gets his name. Because his name is not originally Peter. His name originally is Simon. And this is where his name changes in Matthew chapter 16, where it says this. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So very famous passage that talks about this changing of names where Simon's name is changed to Cephas or Peter uh, at this very moment. So kind of a very important name passage. But what I want to point out is that in this passage, he's not just receiving a name. It's not just a name change, right? The Apostle Peter wasn't just given a name. He was given a calling. That's really what you're hearing here. Just, think, just hear this again. Um, and I tell you that you are Peter, which is the name, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That's what he's receiving in this moment. There's much more than a simple name change. He's receiving a new calling for his life, a powerful calling which will last his entire life. And I think oftentimes when we read this passage, what we can take away from it is this sense that this is just for Peter. This is a very special moment that reflects Peter's special calling and kind of makes him stand out. I think that's a very Catholic understanding of Peter. I used to be a Catholic. And so we think about, um, or we thought about Peter as kind of being the Pope, 
right? There's this very hallowed calling that only one person ultimately gets. But I want to remind us what Paul tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when he says this. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, prophets, second, or, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And so with that, Paul is reminding us that we're all part of the body and we all have a calling. We all have giftings. And maybe for some people it is to be an apostle like Peter, but for some people it might be a gift of healing or administration or something else, but that we all have a calling ultimately. And I think this is an important reminder as we talk and we think about Peter, that like Peter, each of us has not just a name, but a calling upon our lives. Every single person here. And I think oftentimes we get into this perspective where we think that there are certain people in church who have a calling, but not everyone. Not everyone has a calling. Pastors have callings. Missionaries have callings. But the rest of us, we just do work. We just have families. We just have jobs. But I think the reminder that we want to take away from 1 Corinthians 12 is, no, if you're a part of the body, then you have a calling as well. Just as much and just as important as my own. And I really want to make that very, very clear. I have a gift with Scripture. I love teaching Scripture. But I have many shortcomings as well that someone in this body has and has a calling for. And that's something that I think we all need to recognize. In the same way that Jesus comes to Peter and says, you have a name and you have a calling, so does every person who has a name in this room. You do have a calling. And I think many of us need to hear that and recognize it's not just select people who go to seminary or go overseas who have callings, but every single person, if you have a name in this room, which I think everyone does, I'm assuming, you actually have a calling. You have a gifting and a calling that comes from God. And I think even if we just stop the sermon there, for us to reflect on that and think about what is my calling and to kind of understand that we're all called, I think is so important. But moving forward, we learn something very interesting about the callings in the very next passage where it says this in verse 21. This is immediately after what we just read. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is immediately after what we just read. So in, in the first part of Matthew 16, he says, you didn't, Peter, I'm giving this new name. This is Peter, and on this rock, on you, this church shall be built. The early church shall be built. And literally in the next moment, what is he called instead? He's being called by Jesus, Satan, get behind me. Now, he's not Satan, but he's kind of acting in his interest, trying to dissuade Jesus from pursuing the Father's will. So he goes from one moment where he's on top of the world. He's like, my gosh, I just got a new name. Jesus gave me a calling, and I'm good to go. And then the very next moment, he's like, get behind me, Satan. He's like, whoa, what, what just happened in this moment? What just happened? It's interesting for us to recognize that for Peter, he would fail to live up to this name and calling almost immediately. Almost immediately. This is a really important um, Bible reading um, uh, strategy. And that is whenever you're focused on a passage, always read the next one. So if you're at home reading scripture by yourself, never just read a passage. You're like, oh, I'm getting everything I can from it because the next passage will teach you something else. And that's exactly what we realize when we read this passage as well. That there's something going on here because he received this calling and this name. Powerful moment. And yet he falls and he fails in that calling literally. Who knows? Moments, minutes afterwards. Minutes afterwards. And I think this teaches us something really important about callings, which is this. There is a difference between receiving a calling and living into that calling. 
Those two things are not identical. Because I think oftentimes we imagine when callings come, like with Peter, Peter receives this amazing calling. Jesus comes to him and says, your name is Peter, and upon this rock, the church will be built, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, that like light falls upon him. And angels start to go, oh, you know, it's like that is the moment. And after that, he never struggled again because he received this calling, this divine moment. And so he's never going to mess up. And that's our imagination around callings, that all you need is the calling, and then you're good to go. Your pack is full for the rest of your life. But we see very clearly that it's not enough just to receive a calling. You can receive a calling and then fall face down the moment afterwards. Clearly, there is more that we need in our lives to follow after Jesus and simply just to be called. We need to know what it looks like for us to live into calling and not just to receive calling. There's something really, I think last week's sermon illustrates this well, um, too. Because last week we talked about these two miracles in the early church, these central miracles that the entire history of the church revolves around. One is the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. And the second is the, the, this meeting with Peter and this Gentile named Cornelius. These miraculous moments where God is revealing something brand new. Right? He's converting this persecutor of the church into a Christian. And then he's having this moment where Peter realizes through a miracle that all Gentiles are part of the people of God still. And I know oftentimes when we think about those miracles, we think that's all that it requires. It, God just is a miracle and the church has changed. There is no work. There is no faithfulness that has to happen. But when you actually look at the text, what you begin to realize, even, even after those miracles, nothing changed. Nothing changed. Paul is converted on the road to Damascus and he goes to the disciples and the disciples say, we don't want you here. We don't trust you. The miracle itself was not enough. Peter has this amazing experience with Cornelius, this Gentile, and they try to enter into the church, but the Judaizers stand up and say, no, you can't be a part of the church until you're Jewish first. Only then can you become fully Christ's followers. We realize from those passages that miracles are not enough. Can you just, I mean, that's just amazing for us to even think about. That God can do a miracle on the par of Saul being converted on the road to Damascus. And that is not enough to transform your life. There is more that has to happen. And I think that's a challenge for us when we think about our callings. That we must go beyond simply knowing that we have received a calling to thinking about how we can live into that calling it's not enough for us to say, I received a calling in my life, and that's going to sustain me for the rest of my life. I received a calling to be this or to do that, and that's all I really needed is that one single moment. But how oftentimes have we heard in churches when we hear our entire Christian life distilled to one decision-making moment, which is when did you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Just that one moment, because that's all that it is. We recognize there is much more that we have to live into when it comes to following after, following after God and living into our callings. And so that's something that we have to kind of begin to shift our minds from. It's not just that question, what is my calling, but how do I live into that calling as well? And I think that's a very different understanding of calling that we have to confront. So how do we do that? How do we live into our names, into our callings more fully? Well, I think there's a temptation when we're trying to think about how we can live into our callings, how we can live more fully into them. And that is for us to say to ourselves, for some of us, living into our calling means putting more effort into it. We just got to work harder. And I think that might be true for some of us. We're just not really putting in the work into our callings. We're kind of focused on our lives. We're focused on having fun, you know, whatever your Whatever your culture understanding of, you know, going to the club is, you're kind of right there right now, and that, that's kind of your focus right now. It's not on following after Jesus and living into a calling. It's really on something else. And so that might be true for some of us who are hearing this, that the one thing that you need to do in order to live into your calling is you need to put more effort into it. You do need to read your Bible. You need to pray. You need to do those kind of things. And that, that can be true. But I want to go a bit further to say this, that yes, for some of us, living into our calling means putting more effort into it. But that wasn't the case with Peter. You can't really accuse Peter of not trying hard to be a good disciple. This guy threw himself out there. Every chance that he got, he was trying to be the man. He, it was not for lack of effort that he kept falling on his face. I mean, just look at his life. 
He is the first to declare Jesus as Messiah from today's passage. He's also so on fire. He rebukes Jesus, right? He's, he's not the guy who's quiet about his faith. He thinks he knows better than Jesus. He's, he's out there. He's the one who steps out of the boat, right? Out of the 12, he's the one who tries to do this. He offers to build shelters for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus in a very kind of strange moment. Why would they need shelters? I don't know, but he thinks they do. And he's willing to do it. He's the first guy to raise his hand, right? Peter cuts off a man's ear to defend Jesus. He takes a man and slices his ear, right, to defend him. This guy is passionate. He is trying hard. And also, when it comes to Peter's denial, we often think about Peter's denial as a moment of failure. What we should realize is that Peter was following closely after Jesus. That's why he was at that fire. That's why he was in a position to deny Jesus because he was closer to Jesus than anyone else was on Good Friday. This guy was working hard at every single possible moment that he could to live into this calling. When I imagine Peter, I imagine him hearing this calling and saying, I'm going to do it, Lord. Every chance I get, I'm going to be Peter. I'm going to be this rock that you told me to be. I'm going to do it. And so every chance that he gets, he's doing this. And over and over and over again, he falls on his face. I think this demonstrates something really important to each of us when we're thinking about living into our calling and whatever the calling is in our lives. There is more to living out our names and our callings than simply trying harder. It's not the answer. The answer is, Coming from the pastor of this church is you just got to try harder. You just got to be holier. You got to read the Bible more. You got to do more quiet time. I actually don't, I'm not saying it's bad. So let me just stop before I like overemphasize that point. None of that is wrong or evil at all. But there's got to be something more. Because you have this man who has this calling and tries so hard. And yet he fails in that calling over and over. There's something more that we need to truly live into the callings of our lives. There are three things, three moments from Peter's life that I think illustrate for us what we can do instead. The first thing we should recognize is that the most formative moments in Peter's calling are not what Peter himself accomplishes, but what God accomplishes in spite of Peter. That last list I just showed you is Peter doing things on his own, right? I'm going to take out my sword. I'm going to slab this guy. You know, I'm going to shout out, Jesus, you're wrong. That's Peter doing things in his own strength. The moments that Peter actually begins to really thrive and live into his calling are very different. Like from today's passage, right? Today's passage is a great example. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And what does Jesus say? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. He's living into this calling, right? He's saying something amazing and divine. He's, He's speaking, but he's not even the one speaking. Because it's God through him who's really speaking this word, this revelation. It's not Peter at all. You think about another very clear moment in which he's living into his calling, which is from Acts chapter 2. We read this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Peter's living into his calling yet again, but Peter's not even speaking It's the Holy Spirit who is speaking through him instead. And I think this is a good illustration of what calling truly is. Living out our calling means less about what we can accomplish and more on what God can accomplish through us. That is really what it means to live out a calling. And I think why that's hard for us is because many times we confuse the word calling with self-actualization. We think those two things are identical with one another. I'm living into my calling, meaning I'm getting better in my career. My skills are developing. I'm better at what I used to do. All my talents are becoming sharper and more focused. I am living into my calling. But that's not what we find in Peter's life. We don't find him becoming more self-actualized and a better picture of what it means to be effective and accomplished. When he's living into his calling, God uses him more. 
And I think this is a dramatic reshaping of what it means for each of us to live into our calling, including myself. Living into my calling is not me getting better at what I do. Living into my calling is when God is able to use me more. And I think when we think about calling, we need to put away this worldly understanding of I am getting better, I am climbing a ladder, I'm becoming more self-actualized. To this understanding, is God able to use me? Am I being used by God? Because that is what a calling truly is. Another facet of calling that we see from Peter's life is this. For Peter, he would not be able to live into his calling until going through Good Friday and the cross. Another good example of Peter living into his calling is in John 21, where he has this amazing moment of affirmation uh, in his calling, where it says this, three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And the third time he says to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. This is a passage about calling, but this is also a passage about failure and pain. Because Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? in a parallelism to the three times that Peter denied Jesus. He's reminding him of his own failure. And even in the midst of this reaffirmation of this calling that he gives Peter, what does he tell him? Peter, you're going to die. One day someone will take you by the hands to a place you do not want to go, a prophecy of his own martyrdom. This calling... This affirmation of this calling, this moment where he says, follow me, is not, it's going to be awesome. You're going to love this. And you did a great job, Peter. Come and follow me. It's Peter, you, you fell short, but I will restore you. Come follow me. Come follow me to the same place I had to go. That's what this calling ultimately was. And I think, again, this is a dramatic reshaping of what each of our callings is. The path to living into our calling goes through our moments of suffering, failure, and loss, not around them. I think oftentimes when we think about our callings in the worldly understanding of it, the moments that we fail, the moments we get fired, and the moments of doubt and suffering and loss, they stand in the way of those callings. They get in the way of us living into the fullness of who we could be or what we would really want to be doing with our lives. I was doing great until this happened, until someone got cancer, until I got fired, until I had this moral failing, and then it all fell apart. And that's how we often conceive about our callings, that we think our callings are um, in opposition to our pain. What we saw in Peter's life is that his pain is part of the calling. It is part of the story. It is part of what he is able to do, not separate from it at all. And I think we have to understand this truth that the trials you're going through, they are part of your calling in your life. I even think about it for my own life, and I think about what qualifies me to do ministry. Like, I have a degree, and I have training academically to think about Scripture. But I would say the one thing that qualifies me to do pastoral ministry more than any other was my wife getting sick with cancer. Because it was in that one moment that transformed my theology, transformed my understanding of what God was able to do, transformed my understanding of, of what people went through, and did, like, just increased my, my compassion, so many different things. And I would argue, I hate to say it, Fuller Seminary, but I think the more important part of my ministry was my wife's illness and not my academic training. That is my calling. My calling came out of pain, out of those moments, not in spite of them. And I want to encourage some of you who might think very differently about your calling to realize that your calling may actually come out of the pain that you're in, not in spite of it. That maybe your ability to minister to people comes out of what you're experiencing right now. And maybe the, the losses and the failures that you have in your life, you thought, oh, I can't serve God because of those things. Look at Peter. It was because of those things that he was called. So that God would get the glory, not you and not me. And so I hope all of us hear that. It doesn't really matter what you've done. 
It doesn't matter how badly you failed. It doesn't matter where you spent five, ten years of your life. God can use you because that is part of your calling as well. The third thing that we see from Peter's life about calling is this. In some way, Peter never really lives into his calling, even to the very end of his life. Right? We saw today, he's given this calling, and then boom, he falls on his face right away. And so you kind of ask the question, all right, when, when are you going to stop doing that? When are you going to finally be this awesome disciple that you're prophesied to be? When is that actually going to take place? It's actually a good question because there's not a really solid answer to that. Because, yeah, he fails in Matthew chapter 16. We see that. But he also messes up even worse in Luke 22. Matthew 16 is not even the worst of what he'll do because in Luke 22, when a servant girl asks him three times, do you know who Jesus is? He says, no, I've never heard of this man. Even though a few moments before that, on the Thursday before, and he said, Jesus, I would rather die than deny you. Now he can't even say he knows the most famous man in all of Galilee. That's how cowardly he is in this moment. And so he fails yet again. And then in Galatians chapter 2, after the resurrection, after the day of Pentecost, um, Peter receives this revelation that all Gentiles are part of God's family, part of God's creation. And yet despite him receiving this revelation, just a, a few seasons afterwards, he starts to turn away from the Gentiles, won't eat with them because he feels unclean. He won't associate with them any longer. And so even though God had chosen him to give this revelation, he turns his back on that revelation and begins to isolate the Gentiles out of the people of God. He messes up again. And this is after the resurrection, not before it. It's after the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is on him. And he still fails. You fast forward towards the end of his life, and there's another story that comes out of the early church. It's not recorded in Scripture, but it's well known. And it's well known by this phrase in Latin called Domine Covatus. In the, the, um, the rule of Emperor Nero, who is kind of the mad king, the mad Caesar of Rome, uh, he was a persecutor of the church. Thousands of Christians were dying in horrific ways during his rule. And Peter was in Rome and flees the city of Rome in order to escape this persecution, in order to escape death. And so he flees from the city of Rome along this road called the Appian Way. And in this story, as he's walking the Appian Way, he has a vision of Jesus. And Jesus is walking the opposite direction into the city of Rome. And so Peter asked him this question, Domine Covadis. I don't think he actually spoke Latin, but, you know, they imagined that he did. Which basically means, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, I go to Rome to be crucified anew. And this was a rebuke that Jesus was saying, if you're not willing to die, then I'll have to go instead. I'll go back and I'll be crucified anew. And Peter, in that moment, recognizes his cowardice, recognizes that he was fleeing from the prophecy that, get, got, that Jesus had given him, John 21. And so he turns around, and he returns back to Rome, where he will be crucified. But he won't even feel that he's uh, good enough to die in the same way as Jesus, and so he asks his Roman captors to be crucified upside down, because he never felt worthy of Jesus. This is the story of Peter. The reality of Peter, when we ask that question, when are you going to be that guy? When are you finally going to be this disciple that Jesus said you were going to be? The answer is never. Never. He never lives into this stereotype. He never lives into this model. He's this model of doubt and cowardice and pride even to the last moments before he dies. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, any of us can live into this. I think what it teaches us is what a calling truly is. That we can never finish living into our calling because our calling is a lifelong one to follow after Jesus. That's our calling. My calling is not really a pastor because that can come and can go. There was a good 20 years of my life I was not a pastor. Did I not have a calling? Right? Right? There might be a time where I'm not a pastor at some point. I might retire. I hope, praise, thank God if I can, but I'm going to retire. And after that, what will I be? What will you be after one part of your life ends or begins? Did your calling end at that moment? All of our callings are to follow after Jesus faithfully to the very end. And that never ends. None of us will ever be able to say, I'm done 
I'm done. I've, I've faithfully followed for Jesus for 13 years. Woo! Retirement party. No. It goes on and on and on. And we calibrate ourselves and we fail and we fall and we get back up and we continue to follow after Jesus over and over again. That's our calling. It's not about getting better in our careers. It's about following after Jesus and that never, ever ends. And so I want to leave these lessons, Peter's lessons, kind of at your feet because we always ask ourselves these questions. What's my calling? What should I be doing with my life? And I want today to be a reframing of that question, that we be asking very different questions instead. Instead of self-actualization, asking the question, how can I live into my calling? How can God use me more? Because that's calling. How can I live into my calling, meaning how can the places of pain become my places of ministry? Because that's calling. And the third question, how can I live into my calling? How can I continue to follow after Jesus? Because that will always be all of our callings, no matter who we are. Why don't we take a moment to reflect on that and the worship team if you want to come up. Um, But again, I think we spend so much time in this world and kind of just taking in the world's understanding of career, vocation, calling, family, that it's so difficult for us to see a godly calling without seeing it through the lens of what this world has taught us. And so again, I just want to speak those words, what we hear from Peter's life about his calling over each one of us, that we might begin to reframe in a very deep place our understanding, our, the term that we use when we think about calling. And for right now, when you hear that word calling, to hear this phrase, calling is what God can accomplish through you. It's not self-actualization. It's not your potential being realized. It is your ability to be used by God instead. That is your calling. And secondly, to hear this word calling as what God uses, your places of pain becoming your strengths of ministry instead. And so for some of you, just to hear that right now, your calling is that memory that you don't want to confront anymore because it's through that place that God is going to refine you, he's going to strengthen you, and he's going to make sure you know it's not about you, it's about him. And thirdly, that when you hear calling, you would hear a lifelong pursuit that you will never be able to cross the finish line to until the day that you die, until the day that I die, we will not fulfill our callings Because our calling is always to follow after the path of Jesus. God, I pray that right now, that as we hear this passage about names and about calling, that you begin to reprogram us and begin to help us to see calling in light of your Son, in light of your Word, and not in light of what the world has taught us, God. And as we do that, may we have a deeper and richer a more Christ-centered understanding of what it means for each of us, every single person in this room, to have a calling, because every single person does. It doesn't matter what our state is. It doesn't matter our age. It doesn't matter how good we are or our education. None of those things matter, God, when it comes to your calling. Maybe in the world it does. And maybe in the world, those things would disqualify us from one vocation or the other. But in your economy and in your body, We are all called. We are all called. God, I pray even right now, call your people. Call each person to follow after you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. 